Welcome back. If you like the sound of a series of upcoming videos based on the mysteries of Devon and Cornwall, please stay tuned. We have loads of content coming up from our tour of Dumnonia, where we visit ancient inscribed stones, churches, Bronze Age and Neolithic settlements and monuments on Dartmoor, and much more relevant to the matter of Britain. Enjoy! Hi everyone, welcome back to our series on our tour of Devon and Cornwall. Um, one of the uh, the key key um, agendas of our tour was going to see some ancient stones, inscribed stones of of great importance to our our, anti our antiquity in Britain, um, especially when we're looking for Colburn ciphers um, and also just generally stones which are inscribed by Britons um and a, a, ancient people. Um yeah and, and hard physical records of 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 people who are um contested by some academics to even have existed. You know, yeah. so it's it, it's uh, these are contemporary records which is which is really important, isn't it? Hugely important source for that then is that um they're not as not as celebrated and brought to the fore as maybe they should be as primary sources or sources which we can we can garner a lot from um yeah and or even even just as um even as just as as monuments these are pretty save for um some roman inscriptions this is pretty much the oldest writing that you get in britain um yeah they are you know 1500 years old they're some of the oldest they are the oldest christian monuments we have in britain and yet most people hardly even know they exist. Mm. Um, they're just sort of uh, examples of local curiosities rather than a really important record of a, of a of a time that we claim to know very little about. But the evidence is just sat there, yeah. you know, yeah. waiting to be evaluated. So, um, yeah, so um, I took Adam to somewhere where I visited previously. Um, my local town, Tavistock, uh, turns out has got three inscribed stones from the fifth and sixth centuries. And this is something I knew nothing about. And I never would have looked into it if it wasn't for, for Ross Broadstock and, and Britain's hidden history. And I just couldn't believe it that these things were there. Um, they're currently in a private garden in the, in the Vicar's garden. Um, I made arrangements to go and see them. And I knew when Adam was coming down that it would definitely be something that he'd like to see. So mm -hmm. I, um, I I contacted the vicar again, a uh, lovely guy called Matthew, very friendly, very helpful. Um, it is difficult because they're in a private spot. So you you do have to make the arrangements to go and see them. Um, but they uh, Matthew has a very um, good approach he understands that this is really important history and that the, the people have a right to see him um but we we had a great time trying to pick out the inscriptions um admiring the form and the shape of the stones and just having sort of three of them to to spend as much time with as we wanted you know in a, in a really beautiful setting so we're yeah. going to have a look at we're going to have a look at those stones today, and um, and just sort of we're going to talk about more our, more of our experience of being there, uh, and some general thoughts about inscribed stones. And um, in future, we'll do some detailed videos about the inscriptions themselves and the people we might think are being uh, described, yeah. and what alphabets and uh, and letters they used in order to do that. And uh, maybe even a a, a gone the bardic code as well. Absolutely, yeah. We'll have a go at the Bardic Code as well. Excellent. All right. Okay. So enjoy. This this was the the, the first one we went to go and see, wasn't it, Pete? The um, um, the one it was it was in the in a far left corner, just you know, against against the um the, the fence there. The it's it, it's funny how sort of unassuming they look, isn't it? When you yeah. when you first go in, you you sort of go oh. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I mean, then, what was your what was your initial reaction walking into that garden? Well, it, I was I was I wasn't expecting. Um, well, I was I what I was expecting was there to be more of a uh, a display made about them. They've been preserved by someone historically, but the interest hasn't continued in in, mm -hmm. in much, and that that does that does show somewhat. By it is when we were walking up by it and I saw, you know, there's a stone there with some ancient writing on it and it 
yeah, immediately did um, impress on me um, that there's something important here. Um, if that yeah, we're not we're not talking like like um, Margam Stone Museum, are we? Or um, this is it. Yeah. Lamp Major is it? It's, it's very different, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. Um, they, I think the three stones um, were one of them was local, definitely found it in the town Tavistock, and I think the other two were bought from Buckland Monocorum, which isn't too far off, um, as they were discovered. Yeah. Um, the what I found when, when I first went there as well is it's, it's quite a big garden, isn't it? And yes, there's yes. sort of two tucked down the bottom that you you sort of you, you point out as you walk in and you think, all oh, right, okay. And then there's an absolutely whopping one <laughs> half yeah. hidden in the yew tree. And in fact, you know, what you're saying about the interest, uh, interest in it's very interesting, but um, very double interesting. Um, because that one, the uh, Matthew actually had, he was very kind. He got out his loppers and started yeah. hacking back the yew tree so I could read the inscription when yeah. I first went there. Yeah. But, but yeah, it just shows that they, um, it's it's not a it, they were put there to be preserved yes but it's not like they were put in a place of preservation like a museum or a church or something like that where where there is a continuing a continuation yeah. of effort to preserve in, in that sense and this yeah. is no knock against the, the the current caretakers of the stone no. either this, no. this is just something that happens over time you know yeah um Mrs. Bray, who got the first two put in there, she was the she was the widow of an antiquarian who then married the vicar of Tavistock, um, and she had two of the stones uh, placed there by her husband, and she was very much interested in keeping these safe and preserved. I believe one of them was found as a lintel of a blacksmith's house uh, right. on his front door or something like that. They they weren't being loved where they were. Um, right. So it so it was it was a good move to get them where they were, and I think the last one or the one in Tavistock, whether it was the last one or not, I'm not sure, was was a paving slab. Mm. Um, they were doing some renovations in the town, and as they lifted it, yeah. they saw the writing on the other side, which, yeah, I know, but rather contrarily, it, it could have been the fact that it was laid upside yes. down that preserved <laughs> the writing for so long. Yeah, uh, 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 but. Um, it's glad I'm glad we know where it is now. And now mm. every time I look through the granite paving of Tavistock, I wonder how many more might have something written on them underneath. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, yeah, no, we 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 got to be grateful for for places like this who do hold them. You know, for, to to you know they they are kept keeping them out of um, harm's way in that in that way that you know they're not being used in a utilitarian sort of. Absolutely, you know, or, or you know, these days they wouldn't be at all; they'd be thrown away. But it, it's this is a step up from that. Um, mm. But what what um what impressed on me is that 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 will and that instinct to keep them preserved. Uh, but you know, like with, with Mrs. Bray, mm. um, comes from a, a, a general enthusiasm for antiquarian, you know, pursuits at the time. Yeah. And I guess I guess that 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 you know that that antiquarian pursuit for or, or interest in these stones has gone up and down over the years. Uh, Absolutely, it's, yeah. It's, it comes in and out of fashion, doesn't it? Comes in and out of fashion, and and setting up a stone museum, you know, isn't always on the first of everybody's priority list, and it's just getting round to doing these. So we we need you know authorities to take these seriously, I think. And like, yeah. if they won't do that unless we, you know. There's enough of us impressing on the uh, importance and, and antiquity of them, you know, because absolutely that's not presented to you when you when you when you uh, visit visit places like this. It's sort of oh, there's some stones and some more scribbles on it. It's like, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I went to secondary school in this town. And I had no idea they were there, and I knew loads oh, yeah. of them. You know, we're told yeah. told quite a lot about the history of the town. It's a very historic town. But uh, with lots of beautiful features, but I hadn't, these are probably some of the oldest. They are, in fact, probably the oldest evidence of of, of settlement in the town. And incredible. Yeah. I mean, one of them is from Tavistock, but um, yeah, yeah, no mention at all. Um, it's worth noting as well that the um, the parish and and I spoke with Matthew the vicar about this. They they want to get them somewhere where the public can view them, which I think is great. 
That's great. Um, and they want to make sure that they are safe and protected from the elements when they do that. Um, the National Trust in Buckland have tried to, to do dibs on a couple of them, but I don't think people should be paying to see these things. Um, I think they should be publicly viewable. Um, so I think as Tavistock has stayed as a home for them, keeping them safe for so long, that possibly Tavistock should stay as stay as a safe place for them. But as I say, definitely somewhere where they are undercover mm. um, and protected from the elements and freely available for people to visit as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we can hope, you know, we'll we'll keep you up to, updated on that if I if I hear any more about about the movement of these stones. Um it's got to be an expensive enterprise to move several tons of granite. Um, you got to be very careful as well as not damaging them. Um, it, it, it won't be cheap and it won't be easy. And it's something that you've got to do very carefully. But it, it is a just a shame that they are currently in this private setting. And as you say, doesn't have that interest around them uh, that, that maybe they once had. Um, so, should we have a look at me picking out the yeah. inscription? Hit, hit play. So, if you're worried about me damaging these stones at all, they're made out of solid granite, and I was using about one stick of chalk yeah, per inscription. The, the granite like would just one? eat uh, the chalk away at a rate of knots. Um, uh, there was also several cases where we could see chalk still left in from from previous visits. Um, and also, it rained pretty heavily a couple of days after, so there's probably no trace of the chalk left. <laughs> yeah. And I imagine that the uh, acidic rain of the area does a lot more damage than uh, any chalk would as well. There's another half in there, Alex. Yeah, there's another half. Let's get you off there. Yeah, so this one was buried a bit deeper, wasn't it? I don't think the full inscription is, is visible. No. We had to pick some of the ivy off it. Ivy would do tremendous damage to the stone, so um, I'm glad we were there just to just to pick off those little runners that were heading up as well. Um, I think we've got, on that Dartmoor Walks book, there's an illustration of this one which shows the full inscription, so we might go um, have a look at that in a minute as well. Yep. You've got a horizontal eye on that one. Yeah. And then this is uh, this stone as well. Also, stone. had this beautiful niche in, which I think I'll mention think in a minute. Like maybe a name like uh. Sabine or uh, uh, God, the Mason did a good job on that S as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah lovely rounded. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very well yeah. executed. Mm. We've seen so many forms Something and shapes, which are so yeah. commensurate throughout all of these British stones. Whether you find them in Wales or you find them in. You know, the west of England, squished yeah. around there. South Scotland, England. Scotland, whatever this yeah. is, yeah, so it's for here first, right? There's, there is That's a what I think, anyway. continuity yeah. of quite yeah, a few forms of characters, again. which is quite impressive. Around it, around it, yeah. I saw, I saw an illustration from the stones uh, from no, near Hadrian's Wall uh, dated to the same period, right? And it looks like it looks identical in letter forms to the things we've been looking at in the west country, yeah. Um, for a minute, I even thought it was something that we'd seen, and <laughs> before I right. read the inscription yeah. on the bottom, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, th I think what I, what I mentioned about the niche is that the uh, the niche is generally thought to have come later, uh, as 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 a sort of part of. People say about Christianizing the monument, but I mean I'm pretty convinced, and even you know mainstream accept these are probably Christian monuments yeah. already. Yeah. yeah. Um, but what's interesting and other antiquarians have noted is that the letters on the the top are actually squished in around the niche, uh, yeah. which suggests that the niche was there first, which is pretty interesting. Um, it could even be contemporary um, with the mm -hmm. stone, uh, with the inscription, sorry. Um, or maybe it was there beforehand. Maybe it was a, an ancient, ancient standing stone, which had a niche put in it. And then, and then the inscription came later. But I think, yeah, it would be dangerous to assume it was something added after the inscription because uh, because that's not really what the evidence suggests, I think. No, no, I don't think it's a strong argument, really. Uh, this stone had a bray, it's, it's um, form as well, didn't it? Real, like, mm, yeah, anthropomorphic yeah. human size, you know, as broad as your shoulders, as, as high as someone, you know, five for ten, something like that, you know, uh, lovely to, shape to it yeah absolutely i'm beginning to wonder how much that was intentional to kind of give a 
uh, is a anthropomorphic kind of feel to it, you know, especially if you're um, exonerating and remembering real people, you know, it, it, it makes, it adds a kind of spiritual dimension to it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Which is interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's this name Sabini, like the like Sabine, the the Latin name. Yeah. Um. They they haven't even they've shown the niche there, um. But I don't think they've really shown how much those letters are squeezed in. I think they've given it a bit of extra space. They really are squeezed in against the edge of the stone yeah. and the edge and the the niche that's in the middle there. Yeah. Um. um well, I think yeah. we've got a couple of ideas about the name generally the the only thing that's um thrown out is the suggestion that the mac is is of irish influence mm. like you get mab or mab map in mab. welsh yeah but we always already have philly written on the stone in latin meaning yes. son of so I, I i'm not really sure about that um it's an right, interesting so, one. So that that's um, the so the the what you usually presented with is that the Mac is Irish. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's that that's yeah. something that is is thrown out. But I don't think it's not. It's certainly not. Um, uh, certainly not fact. It's it's no. a suggestion that's been made. It, th um, it tends to lead lead over to the, to, towards the um, an, an Irish influence in terms of presentation of ideas of of theories about it about these stones aren't they uh, yeah. it, it's interesting that this one um if it's presented as irish doesn't have any ogham on it <laughs> so it doesn't have any ogham on it yeah. exactly yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so this one this one of the three is the is the one that real gets gets my pulse going just because of the the shape of it the look of it mm. the niche the the quality of the inscription that's still there it's a real beautiful stone, isn't it? It's just, yeah. it, it's the one that I, I knew you you were drawn to it straight away. Yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, and I was the same when I first went there. It's a real, real beauty, absolutely fantastic. It, it it was, and it was the yeah, it was the the sort of size and shape of it, and but it was also to do with, with when I got closer to see the writing on there. Um, it, it did strike me because. Although it is quite faded, it for, for some of its stones that you find of contemporary period, it's hmm. still quite visible, and that quite might be to do with the sort of um, the colouring of the stone versus the you know colouring of yeah the, yeah the it could be a number of factors, couldn't it really? Absolutely, yeah. But but um yeah, it's, it was a quite it was quite a magic thing yeah. to go and see or to be, see sort of it if you. That that's what I remember seeing immediately at the bottom was the mm. when you see it is the the inscription at the bottom it looks quite it's quite big and striking isn't it so yes yeah I mean and that was that was away. from my previous video uh, visit when I didn't have any chalk and you can right and so that's not even been chalked out and you can see that they're sort of like that uh, almost like a, a patina on the on the uncarved yeah section which is sort of dulls it whereas and you can see the the the, the brighter letters yeah. Um, I really like that sort of beveled top as well. It reminds me of the Jatuadoc stone. It's got sort of a point and then just yes. sort of slopes off slightly to the left. Yes. Yeah. Um, it. Yeah. It just it was absolutely fantastic. Makes you wonder whether there was a cross or anything on there at the, at the top, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it's it's got that that form of the the shafts that you saw in in Corn that we saw in Cornwall, didn't it? Um, yeah. You you could imagine a wheel cross on the top of there, or even some sort of decoration. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, but definitely, probably one of the better preserved we saw in terms of inscription, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. It's 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 up there. It's up there for one of the best preserved. Mm. For me. Uh, so you can't, unfortunately, you can't quite see the inscription as I didn't have the um, have the chalk here. But you hopefully you can get the impression of how close yeah. that writing is squeezed in there, around the size of the niche. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is actually very nicely made as well. That niche, it's like polished, it is, it? or not polished at the back, but smoothed at the back. Um, well I have only seen one prehistoric monument with anything similar, and that's from a massive standing stone that's in Germany that has a little niche carved into it, which is very similar. Um, uh, 
which they assume was part of the Christianizing of the monument. Um, but yeah, I've never seen an inscribed stone with anything like that. And I've never seen a standing stone with anything like that. So uh, mm, mm. it's a nice little unique example, this stone. So this is the this is the second stone. Uh, well, I say second, depending on which way you look at them, but it's sort of in the middle of the other two. So we'll go with the second one. Um, it's a bit smaller than the previous one we looked at. Um, as you can see on the top right, there's a bit of iron sticking out of it. It's been used as a gate post um, historically. Um, the inscription was very faded on this one, unfortunately. Um, we do have an, an illustration of the inscription, which we'll look at in a minute. But um, it was very difficult for me to try and pick out any of the lettering on this one. Um, but this is the stone that gets all the attention. Uh, yeah. Out of the three of them, this is the one that gets um, mentioned first. Uh, and that is purely because it includes Ogham as well mm. as Latin or Oam, uh, however you want to pronounce it, um, which was also very faded as well, wasn't it? Um, it was so faded, we couldn't work out where the organ was. Mm, couldn't work out where any of the writing yeah. was. Yeah, um, there were. It, I mean, we could certainly pick out things where we think it might be here, but yeah, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't enough to to mark out and to to be understood, was it? Wasn't enough to no to. Yeah, it wasn't like. You know, with 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 the previous previous stone we've just looked at, um, that was is like when you when you were um, carving the chalk in there. Mm. I said to said to Pete off off camera that it was so cool to see the um, see it being revealed as we were going. You know, it was amazing. But with, with this one, it it wasn't the same. It, there was nothing yeah. um, gettable really. There was a few bits here and there, maybe you know, but it was. And it, mm. it has this it has this preference because of the organ, which is what we see all the time. The organ yeah. is the most interesting thing. Yeah. Um Yeah, it's 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 a bit of a shame. I mean, the 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 organ is fascinating. It is yes, really it is. interesting. You know, it, it is amazing. And when you have stones with both written on and you can translate them and get the same inscription basically from, from both of them, that's really cool. It's sort of shows that that was the intention but it means that especially the ones the, the the stones which only have the latin or brythonic names on become almost secondary to the ones that have have ogham on um yeah. and th that's a problem when we're talking again yeah. about preservation about generating interest it, frankly whether it whichever la language has on them, its antiquity, its importance is equally the same. Um, um, <laughs> Matthew the vicar told us that some academics had recently visited to do to do some scanning of the stones, which we thought was great. Yeah. It was good to yeah. see that that sort of work was being done. Uh, but I believe the project was called the Ogham Stone Project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. <laughs> I, I yeah. believe they did scan all three stones, but still. Yeah. Um, I think, it, as I say, it's just like it, it could be a problem towards the appreciation and understanding these monuments. I, th I don't think uh, which language appears on them doesn't divide them as much as, as you know, it doesn't divide them at all. They are still a set of monuments from that period, from that, that period. culture, from that, that religion, you know. Yes, the, the conversation of um, differing cultures comes into this because we we see often when when presented with an Ogham stone and presented with descriptions for Ogham stones and the culture of origin uh, said to be Irish exclusively and mm. therefore evidence of Irish settlement in, um, in the area. Um, I did the 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 Fanoni stone in the British Museum quite a while ago. Yeah. Which, I demonstrated can can read in Welsh, you know that's but it's also got these Ogham or Owen strikes mm. on the side, which which um so well it must be Irish then um but it's it's worth noting here that none of the stones in Ireland which have Ogham on have any 
Latinate script, yes. or alphabet script on there. So, yeah. so I, I've, I've, I might be repeating myself, um, but I, I think it's worth mentioning here at the time, uh, here as well, that um, the the stone stone masons were mo most likely priests or druids who mm -hmm. whose um, place in society meant that they they didn't operate on the on the same with the same borders basically they had yeah. correspondence from between britain ireland britain france um yeah something recorded by julius caesar yeah um, anglesey being a, a a druid college for it seems to be like quite a bit of big bit of western europe so mm -hmm. these these ideas swap over borders uh, a bit more fluidly than, uh, than you're often presented. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And also, I think just the, we see very commonly this idea of uh, in the fifth century after the, after the Roman withdrawal, mm. um, we are shown maps of Irish flooding into West Wales, Northwest Wales, and into the West Country. Yes. Um, yes. It's very clear from the history that these were repelled by various yeah. Brythonic kings. In the case of West Wales, there was marriage alliances. Um, yeah. And we can see a, a we you can follow the genealogies, how how the, 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 the royal families are related to the Irish royal families as well. Um, but what's interesting how this is that there still seems to be Brythonic dominance in terms of culture, law, language. Because other than this Ogham, there's no trace of Irish culture in, in Cornwall or West Wales. Or, yeah. you know, there's it's no the surviving place names that aren't Welsh in West Wales are Viking. They're not Irish, you know. The, yeah. The, the, there, isn't, there isn't that sign of influence, which, which as I say, that shows that there is a Brythonic dom dominance. Um, but... In the royal families, there would have been a connection to to Ireland still. So, awesome. and I think that does adequately show why they might want their names recorded in a multiplicity, you know, in a multiplicity of languages. Um, but, yeah. but yeah, whether to call it an Irish stone because it's got all of them is just yeah, like, it's nah. it's. No, it it doesn't quite work that way. Um, it, it it doesn't work. And the only reason I think the only way you get to that um, answer through an equation is if you have the Brythonic element downgraded yes. to something which is um, downgraded to a point of um, being ineffectual, which is just the the inversion of what's actually going on. Mm, yeah, <laughs> and I think really it, it's it's only through understanding all aspects of these stones, all languages, even, even down to the selection of the stone itself and the material it's made of, that we're really going to understand this. And we shouldn't be shouldn't be obsessing over certain details and, and elevating them above others. I think it's is risky, basically. It's risky. It, um, it, is, it is, it is. Yeah. Um yeah. and um I think the 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 Irish and and Ogamoan influence in in Wales and Cornwall has been well talked about and well expanded upon. Mm. And now it's a time to have a look at the other aspects, especially the idea of, can we, can we read these in Brythonic, you know, Brythonic yeah. Welsh rather than just as Latin or, or just as Irish. Um, should we have a look at yeah. me struggling through this stone? Shall we? <laughs> So I had some idea of of what the inscription was oh, yes. from from various yeah. antiquarians. I think I'm cross referencing against my phone there, but okay. often I was just sort of this is what you were just pointing I'd out. find something, put a yeah, line in it, is, but then I can't really see what's going on. No, it's really lost in it. This yeah, they've got some chalk in there, haven't they? Well, Alice did well. She spotted a few. Yeah, and here there's a bit chalk. Interesting shape, this stone. It had like a, a flat front and then comes to a point at the back. Yeah, yeah. Like that, sort of like, I don't know if it's shaped like that. It's generally like 
Well, not uh, not like a point, but narrower, like a like a, a cross section would be like trapezoid. But look, I'm really struggling there to find yeah, anything. Um, can't see anything. No, uh, you you, you saw more really... than I could see. You know. Yeah. I had no chance. Yeah. And like, so this has yeah, got yeah, the interesting like... name. Uh, I think it's Jabonus. Yeah. Oh right. Me struggling some more. Yeah, he, looks like you found the beginnings of an R there. Yeah. Sometimes I, I, I think I'd found something. You start drawing it out, and it's just, um, just yeah. like a floor in the stone or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I think it was, this is the one, um, yeah, Dubonus and Enabari, I think, are the two names on it. Right. And it has this suggestion of, of the smith. The word is fabri in Latin. And there's a bit of discussion whether it means, uh, like, this person made this stone or whether it's re recording, like, an epithet, like the guy was called Enbari the smith or something like that. For whatever reason, maybe he was a creator or maybe it's a bit more metaphorical that he that he that he forged something yeah. you know it could have been a political act where he was recorded as the smith or something or or it does literally made mean that this stone was made for um made by anabaris or for dubonus so yeah it's got this name duboni which is is very um reminds us very much of that dorset pre-roman tribe the the duboni oh, yeah um so they've got Nabar there, but I've seen it as Enabar as well. Uh, right. Some people have picked it out as. And then you can see this word fabri. Um, yeah. Sort of like the modern English fabricate to make, you know. Yes. Um, but but as with a lot of these stones, there's very little agreement to A, what is actually written on them, um, and B, how we should then interpret it. Yeah. Um. Often, if you use the Celtic inscribed stones project, you'll see that, that over the course of 150 years, this, these have been visited pre period pre periodically by academics. They will do their best to pick up the inscription and then they will discuss it. And then it sort of gets left um, for the next one to come back 25 years later and do the same thing. I would hope that with new technology, uh, that more of these things are being scanned, not just for their preservation, because, you know, at least we'll have a preserved image. With, with a good three-dimensional scan, we, we might be able to pick out various things that were being, you know, intentions by the mason that we might not be able to see with a naked eye. But, um, yeah, I, I really hope in future we could we can start to discuss these more um, yeah. and try and come up with some more clear-cut answers about, you know, what's being done. Um but yeah, just it's a shame that one is is so poorly poorly preserved. It is, it is, and if there's any truth that that you can be attributed to that facsimile, that's that's an awesome looking inscription. Yes, you know? and you can see you can see the uh, you can see the ogham down the side yeah. of it there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if they've put this this sort of big chunk. Whether they're suggesting that quite a lot of the stone has been 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 removed at some point, broken. Would be suggesting that. Yeah, it could be. At the top there, he's sort of drawn an interesting shape on the flat face, so I don't know. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we, we definitely couldn't pick out anything like that in terms of the Latin lettering, could we? Not at all. Not at all. Real shame. Mm. We'll put a link to this document as well at the yeah. bottom of yeah. the screen. Right. Yes, it is, yeah. It's quite hard to get a shot of this one. Yeah, so that's the... Uh... That's the uh, shrubs that were cut back. <laughs> but yeah. I think you can see that. This one was absolutely whopping, isn't it? And the Prani yeah, yeah. Chili Con Bevy. A couple of metres high, possibly. Right. So I think yeah, there's one here as well. Yeah. So uh, God knows how much was underground as well. Yeah, we're finding that a lot, aren't we? It's like they just really, they really do uh, go much further into the ground a lot of the time. Oh, yeah. Really interesting, like rounded back to it. This one. Um, I do wonder if this was the one used as a paving slab, actually. Yeah, make make the most sense out of three. Yeah. It was quite 
thin and, and say just a bit rounded on the back but possibly smoothed by people walking on it. That R you see, that's a, a, a cipher that you've got to use. Mm. Is that where the where the um, the leg of the R comes out almost at a right angle? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. That's yeah we, we saw a few of those, didn't we? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Over that, the course of the trip. Yeah, indeed, indeed. That that seems to be a, an, another um, a, a character which we see continuity with, which is very yeah excited. As well as as well as those A, you know, the A with the um. The kind of uh, the chevron the angle bottom, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're in the cross section, yeah, that's right. That Have you got a couple in... of the photos I sent you there as yeah. well, just to show it a bit, bit further back to get a sense of the shape and stuff. So that's one without the. You can sort of just catch the inscription there. Yeah, um, yeah. that's without chalk. There we go. Yeah. So, uh, so you can see the U that was hacked back <laughs> there on the left. On the right, and then the laurel yeah. that's taken over on the left. Um, yeah, I think the the, the right hand side of that is what had the uh, inscription on, and the left was the back. And I took this photo just to show the sort of sort of almost crooked back to this one. Um, but yeah, it was about at least two meters high, and quite a, an impressive thing. If this was stood out in the open somewhere, it would um, certainly be visible from quite a way off. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some more because the inscription was quite small and sort of down to one side of the stone. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was some decoration further up, maybe a cross or something that's been lost um, over time. Because the uh, even the even the Latin script was was pretty shallow; it wasn't very well cut into the stone, right. um, especially compared to that first one we looked at. Um, but what a thing as well i mean it it was it's a shame we can't get the scale quite with this photo but uh no, um, it wasn't quite it's pretty justice, fantastic yeah um and very different to the i mean we the uh the first one we looked at was probably sort of in the middle the Ogham stone was the smallest and then this is the biggest um and it's interesting seeing the three of them not side by side but almost side by side um and I think that's another point worth mentioning, actually, is that this Vicar's Garden in Tavistock is the biggest concentration of 5th and 6th century inscribed stones in the West Country, um, which is, is crazy. I mean, yeah. there's a couple of places in Cornwall where you can see a, a couple of them. Um, there's um, some places where you can see inscribe you can see a fifth sixth century inscribed stone next to something from the 10th century or the 12th century um but the three from this period in one place um outside of wales and scotland this is pretty much the only place in england you can see that um which is crazy to think really so really? the i don't know if if they understand the the Parish Council in Tavistock understand the value of just as it as a collection. Um, it, it has a value in that sense as well. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, just to make one trip and see three of these is just not not possible anywhere else in England. So um, that's a pretty special thing, um, and I really hope that they they understand that and and take advantage of it as well. Mm. This could be a this would be a great way of generating tourism money and and and, and visits uh, it's it really is part of our local heritage um and considering that me and adam visited some places with very little fifth sixth century archaeology but which had a huge uh tourist um industry generated towards king arthur you know we drive past camelot this king arthur that in West Devon near Tavistock, there is absolutely zero suggestion of that anywhere. And yet you can go and see three sixth century inscribed monuments in one in one spot. I mean Yeah, exactly. Talk about hidden gems. I mean, that is just Exactly. When it when yeah. it comes to tourism, use what you've got because there's yeah. people out there with, with absolutely nothing. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're still doing it. Still plotting their flag in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Um uh so that's it. That that that's an illustration of the of the inscription. 
It's very bizarre. We've got backward two backwards ends on it. Yeah. We've got that R you mentioned. We've got the A's. I have no idea what's going on in the beginning of... Is that meant to be Philly? Oh, what, at the top here? Yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of... Yeah, it... it... It could be that, couldn't it? It's they mm. they're saying it is. Yeah, it doesn't one hundred percent. It it looks like it yeah. could be it, but on the fa that's from the facsimile anyway. So it's, yeah, absolutely. Even then, if, even, even then, then, facsimile can uh, lead you astray. That they, they haven't written they, they, this R hasn't. They haven't got the kick in it, which is no, uh, no, they don't. No. So this this is what I mean with with being with being careful. If you ever want to look at these stones with the Facsimiles are they're great to work from, especially if you're going to go with, with some chalk to kind of um, sort of have a half an idea of what you're looking for. But really, they're not anything to go by um, in terms of a, a kind of uh, reference for for fact. Not at all. They're they're very they're not very they're, they're quite flimsy. Yeah, that's all right. Oh, I'm just reading here that this one was was used as a bridge over a river. Oh, right. Okay. Which is, okay. It, it happens quite a lot, actually, yeah. because we, we have these in Devon and Cornwall, for those who visit will know, we have these things called clapper bridges, where you basically get one great chunk of granite and lay it flat over the river. Sometimes you can do it with intermediate pylons, and we, we make these long clapper bridges, but sometimes they do very simple ones, which is just putting a single block straight over. And because these things are already ideally size and shape for that sort of thing. There's quite a few in, in Devon and Cornwall that have been used for this function before being rescued. Yeah. yeah. Um, and gate posts as well. That's the other that's the other uh, way they end up being used. I, I just want to mention this first stone again, well, the second stone that we did. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Top stone on here. Because let's, let's assume that, I mean, when was this written? What year was this written? Oh, uh, 1910, is it, or something? Like 1910. That. So, well, no, don't take my word for it. Okay. Um, uh, it doesn't have a date on it. I that. have a feeling it's it's early twen early 20th century. It could be late 19th century. I'm not quite sure. Roughly 100, 120 years, something like that. Yeah. So, 120 years ago, let's, let's assume that the... The, the whoever did this etching and did this facsimile could see a lot more than we can today. Yeah. So in 120 years, we've gone from being able to see this to seeing Naffle. Oh, yeah. So yeah. Th this, I guess, um, a, a big motivation for making these sorts of videos is 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 to raise awareness of them and if anybody's watching who can do anything about possibly housing some stones i don't know how you'd go about it i don't know who's got the rights to it but we need to do something we need to do Absolutely. something to, to, I mean, to take care of these things yeah i mean keep an eye on you know if you if, if you're a parishioner of the parish you you have a right to talk to to your priest and to and to the local parish authority about you know just even if you just make an inquiry, you know what's happening. I, I'd like to be informed if anything changes. Is there going to be public debates about this? Mm. That's one way. It's just just to keep aware, you know, um, yeah. keep your ear down to the ground because often these things, you know, people people wouldn't think about advertising the fact they're going to talk about moving these things or anything like that. They they just assume that people aren't interested or that those who are interested will be in the know. Um, but, yeah, um, yeah, exactly. But, but, but you know, often that's not the case. Often, especially amateurs aren't aren't in on these sort of circles of communication. So, yeah, just no. just keep keep your ear open and and ear to the ground, and 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 if anything comes up, and also go and have a look at them as well. Have a look, you know, Join you know, do what you can. Um, let's say these are currently private, so you, you do need to make an appointment, but there are also plenty in West Devon that you can visit, which me and Adam will be doing a couple of videos on and soon, which you, um, which you don't need to pay to go and see, you know, you can, you can just walk right up to them and have a look at them. So, um, um, and they haven't ended up in the British museum yet. <laughs> so, Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, fair. Excellent. Well, we've seen a, a, a fair few stones on this trip, so uh, strap in. We've got yeah, some, absolutely. Yeah, we've got some interesting ones for you. Could you just um scroll up to the uh, Fanoni stone again? Oh yeah, and maybe you can just edit. I mean, you can cut this up and edit yeah. however you want. There we go. Yeah, so they, they've got here under uh, Fardel stones. I think it was found in Fardel, East Devon. Um, I could be wrong about that. Uh, but Adam's done a video on this. Uh, we, we just mentioned it just now. Um, this is, as far as we know, one of the few inscribed stones that is in any museum. <laughs> um, mm. But it's in the British Museum uh, in particular. It's not in its home in Devon anymore. Um, and... Again, I think part of the reason is because it's got yeah. Irish alphabet on it. Yeah. Um, and this is part of the reason that it's been selected. It could have been to do with who found it, when they found it, and their choice of donating it to the museum, possibly. But I think part of the main reason is is because it demonstrates the the bilingual nature of the stone has been the the important thing. Um yeah. which is very interesting. If you're talking just even if you're just thinking about museum pieces, we definitely saw pieces in the West Country, which would be of far greater interest to museum goers as a piece of sculpture. No, uh, no, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Precisely. Uh, some incredible pieces of artwork with fascinating inscriptions and decorations um, and also repeated uh, uh, evidence of repeated use uh, for various functions, you know. So uh, it is curious that again that we see a preference towards these these to the Ogham Owen stones. Um, yes, you know any any finds which are made, um, and it's never considered that it could be British. You know, and in when we talk about other other sorts of artifacts, and we're seeing that again here with uh, preferences with with um, with Ogham stones. Yes. Yeah. Which is fascinating, considering the the general uh, outlook of British history and academia towards Ireland and Irish studies. You know, this right. is you know, British politics is and and academia has never been in in favour of in Ireland. Favor you know, of Ireland, but yeah. strangely enough, especially when it comes to the the Celtic nations of of Great Britain, yeah, Cornwall, Wales, Northern Scotland. The, Br the Brythonic countries, suddenly it's all about the Irish influence or all about the Saxon influence. Yeah, indeed, indeed. And we, and, um, yeah. and we get this strange diffusionist point of view, um, where, as you say, where things have to be come in and introduced rather than being mm. uh, generated on the soil. Oh, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. It's always played down, always played down this this British element. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I if, if the Irish get it bad in British politics, then have a look at how the Welsh stuff's treated. Yeah, exactly. And you'd be surprised. It's 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 kind of odd. It, it's it's an odd situation to have. Yeah, it really is. It really is. And it's the it's the it's the ancient culture of the island, which isn't exclusive to Wales or Cornwall. It, yeah, actually, no, no, absolutely not. It's span, and it, and I would like to mention about Scotland. Uh, you know, there's a the uh, the, the the big Gaelic um, the, the instinct to uh, promote Gaelic culture there, um, which which is great. You know, in the west western part of Scotland, that's definitely uh, you know mm. um, true that the Gaels of the, the you know descendants absolutely of the Gaels, yeah, but, but in in the south and the east part of the island, the east, you know, definitely the south, the border country, mm. is Brythonic. Absolutely, um, yeah. and the gene, the genetics reflect that as well. And there's no effort to kind of find a continuity between the border country, um, Cumbria, Strathclyde, mm. the old areas of Reged, um, yeah, all of these good old all, all of the Gododin, yeah. the old men of the old north. These are British. Territories uh, yeah. with descendants of British people 
um, living there to live, living there today, who have complete had taken culture completely wiped from you know you know it, it, the Welsh have had, they had a, a hard enough fight to keep the language and things alive you know mm. over here but there there's so many people in Britain who belong somewhat to this British culture anyway Ab- absolutely the the the, the uh, Cumbrian um, dialect of Brythonic um, completely vanished and eradicated despite being you know recorded up until something like the ninth or tenth century mm. still being used and it's now gone and also scott i mean scotland has some fantastic collections of of brythonic inscribed stones as well yeah, yeah. you know i mean e- equally as good as the ones you find in wales just uh, abs- whether they are you know looked after as well as say the ones at margham or or um Lantwit, i don't know but mm. They have some great stuff there, which I'd love to get up and see. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, and it's, but again, we see that trend of this stuff is maintained in the West, um, generally speaking. Um, yeah. And if we want to understand this period, we need to stop thinking of Britain as as Scotland, Wales, England, and you know, and the southwest or Cornwall or whatever, and think of it more of it as an east-west sort of mm. or southeast and west and north divide. Yeah. Um yeah. is is more more appropriate. Um uh yeah, and huh, these stones are a good way of doing that, a good way of, of, of tracking that. Um of where the flora of this of this nation was, especially during the fifth and sixth century. Um yeah. And how they were writing, they were creating stone monuments, you know, they were re-inhabiting towns, uh, re-urbanizing Roman centers, they were um, importing pottery and ideas and glassware from um, Byzantine um, Empire. I mean, and this was at a time where they were meant to be grubbing around in their mud huts because the Romans are gone and they didn't know what to do with themselves, <laughs> which is clearly nonsense. Clearly um, and and archaeology, you know, archaeology is coming around to that and, and definitely has been moving that way for the last 30 years. But unfortunately, yeah, yeah. on the ground, so to speak, the general discourse and discussion it has just not changed at all. Um, uh, but hopefully an appreciation of these stones as I say, some of the old, the oldest Christian monuments in the country, some of the oldest examples of writing, some of the oldest examples of stone sculpture. Um, let's let's generate some interest and and let's uh, you know let's dive into them because they're fascinating, absolutely yeah. fascinating. Yeah, and if if anybody in uh, any region of Britain has any locally, um, you want to come and talk and show pictures of them or whatever get in mm. contact get in contact we'll we'll showcase anything that you've got yeah uh, and we uh, uh, sorry just to bring up preservation again adam um it's not just the stones outside that are the problem is it because as from our visit to lusley and wareham yeah yeah these yeah. things were tucked in at the back of the church with sta- chairs stacked against them yeah. tables put in front of them you know, collecting dust might have one line of information about it somewhere, um, which is amazing considering some of these things are the oldest evidence of Christianity on this church site, st- spreading back to before Augustine of Canterbury arriving. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yet they're just sort of tucked in at the back of the church. You know, it's... It's just mad. I, I I feel like in a in another country, if you you would that would be the pride of place. It would be, you know, in the center with a spotlight on it, with a glass case around it, yeah, and 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 reams of reams of information about it. But exactly that, exactly, it's just that. not the case here. No, we're being very British about it, aren't we? Very self deprecating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is a shame. It's a real shame. Real mm. shame. We, yeah. we, have, we have to reverse that. We have to get get. Uh, we have to change that up. Yeah, and as I say, just referring back to Tabby, 
I think, the biggest collection of 5th, 6th century inscribed stones in England. You can see in one place, and they're in a private garden. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not even public knowledge to the to the people who live in the town. So yeah, let's hope we can let's hope we can change some minds about that. Let's let's hope. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed that. And yeah, please stay we tuned. Will, because... We will uh, we will come back to talk about some of the names on these stones at some point. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. And dive that a bit deeper. And as Adam says, maybe even try a bit of reading with Welsh and. Uh, yeah, and we'll see how far we get. So, see, see what we can do. Um, so next next time we, we've got we've got stones. It gets a little bit more symbolic and a little bit more esoteric. With the next 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 one is very enigmatic and mysterious stones with very uh, curious inscriptions and and things on. So we get into a bit more of a symbolic one next time. Yeah. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, we've got plenty more coming. So. Please stay tuned for that too. Thank you very much. Great. Cheers, folks. Cheers.